Hello, I'm the Diarano, and in this analysis video, I'll be continuing my chronological look at My Hero Academia for anything relevant to Deku's original information gathering quirk, which superpowers in the world are called quirks. According to my research, Deku's original quirk is a powerful scanning quirk that attempts to fulfill Deku's desires by mentally and physically manipulating Deku to make him do exactly what it determines he should do according to what it scans for, but it has a lot of issues. This will contain spoilers for the My Hero Academia series. This is your final spoiler warning. I do want to mention that with me changing locations, this caused me to not have the camera available this time, and there will be differences in the audio quality as I tried out multiple recording environments. I doubt I'll get the camera working again anytime soon, but next video the audio will not have any issues. And sorry about the delay, but it wasn't the best environment to record an unusually long video, but I believe my videos should come out quicker from now on. But I'm not making any promises. The event I'm going to cover is the Summer Training Camp Attack, which is the event that I found a massive normal amount of manipulation that is usually due to Deku's original quirk was actually caused by something else this time. The initial warning sign of this came from Deku at the beginning of the attack had to have had his original quirk off due to the weakness I call standby mode. Which is, it keeps itself off to not strain Deku's mind till desire activates it. Which, since Deku was not expecting an attack and then the villains were able to ambush Pixie Bob, cracking her head open, who was next to Deku, despite how Deku's original quirk if active, would have saved her easily by at least immediately moving to save her the moment she was attacked. Since Deku didn't do anything, Deku's original quirk had to have been on standby mode. But then I looked through the event and saw an extreme level of manipulation, the exact kind I would expect from Deku's original quirk if it was on well before the attack on Pixie Bob moving everyone into position for a planned counterattack over an hour before Deku's original quirk activated. Which, since there are other people with similar powers, this clearly revealed there was at least another scanny quirk wielder manipulating the event. So I reviewed the summer training camp for the manipulator, which the results surprised me as it showed the entire summer training camp was something completely different than what it seemed to be. We can identify this by just describing the excuse they gave us for the summer training camp and how it played out. UA High decided to send out Class 1A and Class 1B to a secluded, far away from reinforcements with a skeleton crew of pro heroes, which many students were not allowed to legally fight back if villains appeared. Since it was a boot camp that also often spread the students out at many points, all around leaving them in an exhausted, isolated, vulnerable state over a few month long period of time. That meant if they failed to keep it a secret from the villains, there will be casualties, mass casualties. But due to the fact Principal UA High and the teacher All Might would know the attacking group the League of Villains is secretly run by All for One, the godlike villain who made the greatest criminal organization in the past, which even so, All For One's organization was significantly dismantled. In the past, there'd be no way the principal of UA would believe they could run the summer training camp in secret from them due to the sheer amount of expected resources that villain group should have had left. Therefore, they knowingly sent Class 1A out there to be attacked by the League of Villains and made them look very vulnerable. Which, if we factor in the end result, all pro heroes and students survived the summer training camp attack, plus the heroes used the fleeing League of Villains to capture All for One in 24 hours. This makes it clear the summer training camp was a baited trap. Which since the hero side would believe if they don't get All for One soon, that guy like villain will easily defeat society, while the hero's only weapon against him, one for all, is weakening over time becoming ineffective, during the transfer of it to the new wielder, Deku, they'd be desperate enough to use teenagers as bait as soon as possible despite the morals explaining this drastic move. Since there were no casualties despite they spread out the exhausted students for a training event, which 
The villains attacked and should have killed many of them. But instead, the villains were heavily devastated by the supposedly randomly placed, spread out, exhausted, in-training heroes. Clearly, society's secret operations had a plan to keep the in-training heroes safe, which should be expected as they're not just some immoral group that will do whatever it needs to take to get the job done. They are good people and they wouldn't just risk the lives of those young in-training heroes, so they would try to keep them safe, even so they're using them as bait. So now, we look carefully at this event to catch society rigging it, and what was the plan? First, a basic description of what the training event was around the time the attack occurred. It was a haunted trail which Class 1B would be the scarers and Class 1A would be the ones to be scared. Moving as two-person teams every three minutes, sent out along a large trail that loops back in on itself, close to the starting point and already five groups were sent out, and still on a trail, when the attack happened, so about 15 minutes went by while Class 1A would be in constant movement. And since them being in the right place at the right time was vital to counter the overwhelming force that should have killed them otherwise, as different threats hit different areas needing unique responses, the heroes had to have secretly rigged the students' locations and have made sure the villains attacked at the right time, which it being about 15 minutes after the training event began, when a small window of opportunity with the vital groups that were moving constantly would be in position, the heroes had to have somehow made the villains attack. Since there was no report of the heroes instigating the fight, but instead the villains made the first move without any sign of hero side interference, that means this probably was an inside job, so a double agent inside the League of Villains. Which, if you look at the fact, soon after the League of Villains were revealed to be run by All for One, about all those that attacked the summer training camp, joined. So we should expect society to attempt to put in double agents among the new recruits, which would explain why we are seeing the strong signs of a double agent. Now to figure out who it was, first the double agent had to have been involved in the attacks that would initially alert the heroes, forcing the rest of the villains to make the move, which is Dobby setting the force on fire, which twice was teamed up with him so he also is a suspect and Mustard, sending poison gas off at a different location. Before this video's end, I will be able to make a good case against one, but for now, we need a bit more data. Looking back at the process the heroes were assigning Class 1A students, we can see that it was Pixie Bob who handed out what was claimed to be random lots to assign Class 1A positions, which clearly, by how things played out, was secretly wrecked. Showing clearly, the Wild Wild Pussycats were not there to be the outside school training specialists as they claimed to be, but instead were there for the mission to get off one. It is clear society would send in a trusted group of experts to run the operation, not relying on UA, a respected but not an active key part of secret society defenses. Society also didn't allow the powerful manipulative scanning quirk wield of the principal Nezu to be there leaving UA with no one that can pull that manipulation off on the battlefield. Therefore the ones leading the operation was the outside hero group, the Wild Wild Pussycats. Which has Ragdoll, the rank 32 hero who beat the millions of other heroes to get that possession with only a manipulative scanning quirk, so the most powerful one due to she only has above average female strength, with no sign of utilizing hero gear at all, which meant her scanning quirk capability should have been beyond deadly, so basically the most powerful one. Such a powerful scanning quirk can easily set everything they need up for the plan that we can see, so we have identified how society pulled this plan off, and the scanning manipulative quirk they used. We can also see despite they were acting like they were caught off guard to not scare the villains, the pro hero Mandalay and the student Todoroki demonstrated they knew Ragdoll would protect them by stating it. Trust the safety of the other students to Ragdoll. Hopefully Ragdoll can take care of everyone else. Which since Ragdoll only has a scanny quirk, there'd be no way she'd be able to reach everyone to help them unless she had pre-planned well in advance of the attack, showing they understood. She saw the attack coming well before it happened. Though for Todoroki, I can see it being a common sense conclusion due to her known power, instead of knowing there was a secret plan, but also at the same time, 
I did find Saidi was interested in recruiting Todoroki around this time, which can explain why he was the only in-training hero stating this. But going back to Ragdoll, since I did mention Ragdoll's power is publicly known, she know that whenever she starts actively making any move, the villains would probably get on guard, therefore explains why Pixie Bob was the only one who moved everyone into position. Ragdoll being part of Pixie Bob's team for 10 years and had plenty of time to pre-plan could easily set up silent signals to make Pixie Bob move that no one would notice. Plus, Pixie Bob made it normal for herself to be seen with that scanning device on her eye, therefore can have it potentially secretly scan for things that can't be seen, potentially including invisible marks on the paper lots to know who to send it to. And small what made to look to be glitches to tell her it is time to move and what to do, while acting as if nothing is a matter, her 10 years of experience she has with Ragdoll, so she has done this many times prior to this event. Which, since the device Pixie Bob used will be soon destroyed, the evidence was destroyed on what truly was, and what kind of modifications they did to it. With Pixie Bob being the only other secret planner with Ragdoll, it doesn't come as a surprise that Pixie Bob announced the training event the villains will be lured into attack, before anyone else showed a sign of the training event. Which Pixie Bob was the only one shown explaining the rules and sending people out, into the training event, so Ragdoll clearly attempted to have Pixie Bob to publicly take credit for the training event, while secretly it was Ragdoll. If I use my future Deku narration theory that states this is a retelling of events by future Deku, we can see due to the fact Pixie Bob was not shown handing out the lots, shows Ragdoll had made sure no one figured out how she communicated with Pixie Bob, therefore future Deku didn't even show it in his retelling of the story how Pixie Bob handed it out, as he knew he didn't know what was important. Future Jack, who just said it happened in the story by how it was placed in a way we can find it, while stating how effective it was by not showing much on how they pulled it off besides who was involved. I'll now look at the, what they did with Deku, as society would know Deku's original quirk would have Deku running around the battlefield, manipulating events, all over the place. So it'd be important to make sure Deku's original quirk would be focused on what society wants it to, or it would have probably changed things they didn't want changed. We can see Deku was the only one place in a single person group, and was last to go. With what I know of Deku's original quirk, this would give the most time for Deku's desires to not focus on the upcoming training event. With the around 15 minutes Deku was waiting, and for the around 9 minutes before Deku goes, then placing the attack happening close to the middle of the time Deku would wait to go would give Deku's desires the most opportunity to not focus on the training event and to stop its initial scanning with all the groups already in position with their plans very clear for far more than enough time to be scanned so the scanning would probably have stopped by then, giving the villains enough time to slip in undetected. Plus had no team members that would interact with him, potentially planning with him, getting him focused his desires on the event. Therefore, this was intentionally putting Deku's original quirk on standby mode. By making Deku have no desires activating his original quirk, a clean slate the heroes can plant information Deku's original quirk can scan for to take control of Deku's original quirk by having it at start form its plans around the advantages society set up, avoiding its stubborn behavior of refusing to change course by making sure the first plan it makes and all the rest of them are in line with what society wants. Clearly, Ragdoll and potentially her whole team would be briefed on everything, including Deku's original quirk, due to Deku's original quirk would be needed to be heavily factored in to Ragdoll's plan for the villain attack, and Ragdoll's quirk can scan for other people's quirks, so she should be able to pick out Deku's power to a significant extent, therefore would probably have been even told about one for all. So it wouldn't surprise her out there seeing so many quirks all attached to a single child. This makes Ragdoll and potentially her whole team top tier secret agents working for society that know everything about what is going on. Which has already been stated 
before just by the fact they were sent there to take out Wall of One. If you look at the basic initial positions of all the students out along this haunted trail training event, strong manipulation can easily be detected. First, the poison gas lethality was stopped by Class 1A Yarozo, the only one that can make gas masks instantly out in the field, so only one that can save them and track survivors down in time, just with her powers alone. But since that means if she was put in any other group of two-person Class 1A in training's heroes, that would have stopped her from being able to reach the ones in need of help in time. Clearly, this was no coincidence. Disposition had to quickly get the gas mask to the Metal Crook wielder guy who handed him out, making a group that would counter-strike the poison gas villain mustard before anyone else could. Therefore, the attacking group would obviously send in a high defense metal quirk wielder guy which would prevent Mustard from using his gun the heroes didn't know about effectively. So a multi-step plan to give the heroes the best shot to without casualties take out Mustard. Since Mustard was actively shooting his gun at the heroes attempting to inflict fatal damage, while it is clear since all the students survived, therefore any secret agent wouldn't be actively trying to kill the heroes, we can dismiss the possibility Mustard is a double agent. And since society would probably not want the double agents beaded by the heroes, but instead head back with the villains, Mustard being faced with such a large amount of secret plans to take him down, instead of just letting Yarozo gas mask prevent his attack from killing anyone, making him not a major threat, also further destroys the possibility he is a double agent leaving Dobby in Twice, which also within Season 3 we will receive a long exposition scene from Twice showing he is truly loyal to the League of Villains, not society. Therefore that leaves Dobby. I have looked far into the future events and I do understand the complicated background Dobby has that would make this very unlikely he is a double agent. But the other two have proven themselves to not be the double agents. But of course I won't just accept that without looking further. If we look yet other things Dobby did, we end up seeing plenty of deceptive actions a secret agent would do. First, not having that raging forest fire not consume the heroes that many were unconscious, probably needed a heavy level of scanning to understand how to safely place it in an area it won't spread in dangerous ways which secretly communicating with Ragdoll would provide. The next thing, clearly, there was no special plan in place to take out Dobby as he was able to freely allow to be cloned by twice sending an exact copy through a text that grouped up survivors at the valley point. He clearly could have torched them with his power, but since Dobby didn't, he must have held back. We can observe the first clone of Dobby that attacked Aizawa had called him Eraser. Looks like your concern has you distracted, Eraser. Which is a reference to Aizawa's hero name, Eraserhead, that describes his quirk, that suppresses people's quirks which Eraserhead had already attacked the League of Villains a few months ago. Demonstrating his powers, even so Dobby is new, with Dobby saying his name allowing Aizawa to look at him, therefore can use his powers to suppress his quirk, and also despite the history between Aizawa and the League of Villains, demonstrating his incredible ability to dodge, Dobby left an easy for Aizawa opening to dodge while still looking extremely aggressive. Also after Aizawa dodged him, Dobby acted surprised his quirk was suppressed, which as I said before, Dobby had already called Aizawa a racer, so should have known. This clearly looks to be Dobby throwing the match, in what appeared to be an aggressive attack to make a convincing excuse for why he didn't kill any of them. During that attack, which even so that Dobby was a clone, it mentally is a perfect copy, so should have self-preservation, yet didn't at all show any sign of disloyalty as it died due to the cloning process doesn't make them that durable. But before Dobby had demonstrated his incredible loyalty to the end, he was calling the League of Villains lies out, saying he doesn't see how they could be telling the truth or deserve his loyalty. So him now showing he's willing to die shows clearly signs of a determined actor trying to deceive everyone around to get into the roles he wants. We can see over time when Dobby is facing the heroes at the rally point, he keeps leaking information, unlike everyone else who kept the mouth shut. Unless they think the person had no chance to tell the others, saying they want to tear down the public view of hero society 
by ruining the most renowned hero school, Yue Hai, and the symbol of peace reputation. The two most trusted pillars of the superhuman society, but embarrassing incidents have damaged the world's trust in you both. Saying that the students were the target, so obviously encouraging them to pull out all the stops to win. You pros ought to lay off. We haven't come here for any of you, so just stay out of our way. You worried for your students? I wonder if you can save them in the end. See you soon. Saying they only brought a handful of people to attack. It only took a handful of us to separate you from the pros and start picking you off. Confirming Bakugo is a target. Imagine how they'll react when they find out you let a student get kidnapped. And constantly encouraging them to go on the offensive to beat the outnumbered villains, which all basically is useful information. After that, an in-training hero accidentally got spotted by Dobby. Which Dobby saved him by hiding that fact from his partner twice and leaving the spotted in-training hero alone. And then since Dobby was given control of that Nomu, which when he called it off to send it back to leave as soon as the mission was over, the Nomu was an instant away from killing too, which Dobby supposedly didn't know what it was doing. So obviously he didn't know and was forced to call it off while hoping no one notices how suspicious it was. Which, it does look like the villains weren't monitoring the Nomu, so Dobby did get away with it. We can also observe the Nomu has an insane amount of mechanical parts attached to it, which would have been heard wherever it goes. Which, despite it was charging around, no one reported hearing the loud mechanical sounds coming from it, and only was seen in the gas attack area. So was it in the gas attack area the whole time, where the only targets would be unconscious, hiding them in the brush, targets that can't be found. A perfect place to send it if you don't want it to get people killed. We can also hear Dobby say twice had to remind him to send a Nomu out. Shouldn't you be calling that Nomu back? You said he would only react to your voice, correct? That's right. You're the one who reminded me to let him loose on the students earlier. So Dobby looks to have tried to keep the Nomu off the battlefield, but only was able to delay its release which was plenty of time for the poison gas to hide everyone in the area it was sent to. We do see at the end, in the final battle again, Dobby not going on the offense. Despite he should have been able to kill many of the heroes, he chose instead a defensive position guarding the objective, which would be a perfect place to not go on the offense without being suspicious. And only really helped the villains capture the target Bakugo when all eyes was on him, making it clear if Dobby doesn't do it, he will be suspected of being a double agent. And after that, the hero side claims they tracked down the League of Villains by being able to track down Dobby. Due to everything else we've seen, this clearly was no accident. Plus, if you look at the excuse from the hero side on how they tracked down Dobby, getting to the League of Villains, we can see they were lying. First, the report showed an uninjured person was scared by the normally calm Dobby who was a burn victim, making him look creepy. First off, the police officer should have seen how offensive that civilian harassing a burn victim was, which that report should have been forgotten, gathering dust. Which somehow the police officer, Tsukauchi, who is fully trusted by society's secret operations, pieced it together. While the police officer who took those should have been dismissed report looks extremely uneasy, showing he knows what he is hearing doesn't make sense. While both pro heroes in the room were not at all happy to police track down the missing student and the League of Villains due to they know what they were experiencing is an act to cover up the actual way the information was gathered. So it is clear we have identified the double agent. For one last thing about Dobby, there was a future narration in the Summer Training Camp Attack event that had future Deku talk about his feelings about the double agent Dobby. While we were trying to protect Kachan, our classmates had their own problems back at camp immediately following Mandalay's message. Which Dobby was called a problem, basically trouble, despite future Deku has shown he knows in the future Dobby did all this as this is retelling of the events by future Deku, showing what he knows. Which means that since we can dig it out that he's loyal to this such extent, clearly future Deku knows. There are two potential explanations. First, with the extremes this double agent and probably the others will find go to, it would conflict with the heroic moral nature of Deku and Deku viewed as trouble. 
The second explanation: it may have been a complete mistake working with specifically Dobby. For this future narration, I thought of three possibilities that this could be indicating. First, Dobby is loyal to the heroes. Second, Dobby was loyal, but eventually turns on the heroes. And third, Dobby is secretly working with All for One. Now, the event being so early, our view is limited. But from what we've seen so far, for the first possibility, of course, there was plenty of proof. He is loyal to the heroes, with everything Dobby did for them. For the potential of much later on deciding to turn on the heroes, if true, at this point, this early in the series, there was just no sign of it. But a third explanation, secretly working for Off One, does have some powerful, interesting points. Since none of Dobby's actions led to the heroes getting Off One's location, as it was done by Yaroso putting a tracking device on a Nomu, then falling unconscious, not giving a report for a long time. Dobby had no idea as well, which everything Dobby did that he was aware of actually was focused on harming the League of Villains, as it wouldn't lead back to Off One, but Dobby's actions would have destroyed the leader of the League of Villains, Shigaraki, if he was more successful. Having Shigaraki Force fail miserably, losing almost all the top tier villains delivered by top tier villain organizations, while at the same time. Losing all the objectives despite having such an advantage, so no villain force would ever take Shigaraki seriously again. And then bringing the heroes to Shigaraki's doorstep, which the heroes may be able to finish him off, or if Shigaraki escaped, he would have nowhere to go due to his reputation damage. If Dobby is loyal to All for One, that meant he was trying to kill Shigaraki, which is something that is reasonable as. Everyone in All for One's organization at that point hated Shigaraki, viewing him as massively incompetent with how much big of a fool and morally bankrupt he is. Which Dobby clearly said his disgust at Shigaraki, but due to All for One desperately wanting to make it personal to hurt All Might, that made him choose Shigaraki due to the blood relations to All Might's teacher to be considered the future leader of his group. Though All for One did have other major plans for Shigaraki, the intended end result would be something he have to hide from most of the ones he is leading. Therefore, Shigaraki being the new leader would be the only thing most of All for One's followers would be aware of, leading to severe tension. Those followers of All for One would be trapped, watching the disaster unfold as they would never publicly strike at something so important to All for One. Which instead, many would consider secretly killing Shigaraki. So, if Dobby is loyal to Off One, that would completely explain all his actions. Which we actually can see at the end of the summer training camp, when a warp villain was trying to teleport everyone away. It looked like the teleportation villain slipped up, and specifically said, "Dobby, it is time to leave." The supposed new guy among the many other equally as new villains. Let's go, Dobby. Him saying that meant there probably was a past connection. Supporting Dobby is trying to assassinate Shigaraki. Which, since Dobby was the only one given control, that Nomu shows preferential treatment as well. Despite Dobby clearly showed he was the least loyal, specifically calling Shigaraki out. So for now, though the possibility of Dobby working with the heroes has a lot of evidence. The trying to assassinate Shigaraki not only takes into account all that evidence. But answers even more questions. Now to look at the rest of the manipulated positions of the heroes. Looking at how Moonfish, that villain, had fought the most effective to stop him combination. Choji, with his heightened senses, would have stopped any ambush by this villain's deadly quirk by detecting it, allowing Tokiyami enough time to use Dark Shadow. Which, since the Dark Shadow quirk from Tokiyami had demonstrated it easily would have handled Moonfish. This was a combination to make sure Moonfish wouldn't stop Dark Shadow activation with an ambush, since the Takayami's control over Dark Shadow was being weakened for training. He was basically a ticking time bomb. With any momentary lapse of mental control, he slaughtered the people out there. So sending him off into a haunted trail to scare him, having him go first, facing the most scales without a light source to contain it. Ragdoll clearly intentionally was trying to set Takayami off. 
but specifically when Moonfish appeared, or that be the most negligent move ever, which would be unrealistic, with Ragnall's scanning ability should have detected the issue. Also since that plan had actually had Moonfish escape, we can expect backup plans from Ragnall, which Deku's original quirk sent Deku there and got Dark Shadow to Moonfish. So that was a backup plan, using Deku's original quirk to assist areas Ragnall's plans are failing, which should be expected. For Bakugo and Todoroki, since Bakugo was the main capture target and the combination of the quirks would be unstoppable, and the attacks they used would be so massive, everyone would see where they are. Ragdoll was using that group to lure the villains to the deaths and keep them from attacking random groups if plans to deal with each villain doesn't go as planned, by controlling where they go next and make sure it's to the deaths. The group Earphone Jack and Invisible Gore were both taken out by the poison gas and given gas masks surviving. Since both of them have incredible information gathering abilities, with Invisible Gore can go anywhere without any chance of being spotted, and Earphone Jack can hear things in the battlefield, those two would be wild cards, altering countless events all over the place and potentially identifying society's hidden plans. Therefore, I can understand why they were taken out by poison gas. They had no chance of seeing coming due to it was silent. Brutal tactic, but at this point it is clear, society would be desperate enough to do such a move. We can also see society took out the rest of the intel gatherers. Choji with his highly powerful senses had to deal with containing Dark Shadow, so he was just too distracted to detect anything. The able to talk to animals and train hero Koji was paired with the very commanding Ida. Which with how easily pushed around Koji is, with how clearly nervous he is, there was no chance Ida wouldn't be able to have Koji do whatever he says. Therefore, when Ida was told all the training heroes are to head off the battlefield to the valley point, he's going to take his partner with him easily. Therefore, removing Koji's ability to affect the battlefield and stop them from being able to detect anything society didn't want him to see. And if there was any in Class 1B, they were taken out by the poison glass. Last one, Yarozo, she was preoccupied with the gas, therefore also was not a factor. Which I already covered Deku's original quirk, and since Deku's original quirk will not tell Deku personally about anything it sees, cause of social phobia, it was safe for Deku's original quirk to scan everything. And there were a bunch of students taken away for remedial classes due to the failure in the final exam, and about four that were also sent to that group once the villains started attacking. But since the end result was all students live and the enemies devastated, they were not needed, and having more roaming around would have deterred the villains from attacking, so it was sent away to make a better baited trap. And would be able to have strength in numbers for the potentially injured students that be looking to take shelter from the areas the villains were attacking, heading to the rendezvous point they were all told about. So a good strategic advantage in case things go bad, to organize quickly to make things happen on the battlefield. And last one, Uraraka and Froppy. Due to episode 8 of my series, identifying they are secret agents recruited during their first year at UA, and there was a major operation happening with them in the area, and they were paired together during this major operation, clearly. They were sent out there to do a job. Now to see what they were specifically doing, we can see that Uraka and Foppy constantly stood by each other, fighting together, caring for each other strongly, which happened a few weeks after they were paired together as secret agents, which clearly would be expected behavior with how Foppy is supposed to support Uraka with his sudden unexpected recruitment. We can observe Uraraka had an extreme amount of natural happy emotions when Froppy was chosen to be her partner and showed ample realistic nervousness as probably she doesn't like haunted house like attractions. Therefore she probably was not told about her mission, which Froppy as well seems naturally oblivious to any mission. Even so Froppy had been recruited for multiple months, Uraraka only was recruited for a few weeks at most due to it happened right after the final exams. And this is a summer training camp, and therefore would start soon after the school year ends. In that short amount of time, they would have no reason to believe Uraka would be able to act natural during a mission, 
Therefore, if they would use her, they would not tell her, so the villains wouldn't find her actions suspicious. And instead would give them ways to get told after the other parts of the mission unrelated to them were well underway. To make sure, if Uraka and Froppy start acting suspicious, the villains would have already been fooled into thinking they have the upper hand, so wouldn't be affected by potentially poor acting. Which things that could alert those two on standby as secret agents could be code words, and I think it was code words, so I'm not listening to anything else. We can see no villain had attacked them for a very long time into the event. They were by far the last group to be attacked, leaving a large amount of time unsupervised, which is very suspicious. And even so, when a villain finally attacked them, Toga, which on the surface seems not suspicious, but when we have Toga attacking after such a delay, while just in time for hero reinforcements to wander into the area, and the main manipulator, Deku's original crook, sent Deku to Toga only after all of the threats that he could get to were taken care of, despite the potential raping and blood draining threat Toga seemed to be. All this obviously tells us Uraka and Froppy were on a mission and this event was heavily manipulated. So now to look for how it was manipulated. We can solidly prove Toga was tracking them well before the villains attacked. Which, besides the fact this scene here showing Toga tracking them happened before the attack occurred, we can see Froppy offered to hold the hand of Uraraka during the Haunted Trail training to comfort Uraraka, and still was in the same hand-holding position as they walked by Toga. You can, if you watch the animation, see that Urak and Foppy arms they were holding hands with was not moving when they walked past Toka, which shows they were holding hands as otherwise it would be a weird arm position. Sorry I can only show still images as I am trying to avoid copyright infringement, but you can watch the episode a few second long clip for that evidence. Since Uraka's power goes through her hands, therefore it would cripple Uraka's options if she didn't have her hands free, and potentially leading to accidentally harming a Froppy, and Froppy is far more mobile than Uraraka. Therefore, holding Uraraka's hand would eliminate most of Froppy's options. Therefore, they wouldn't be holding hands once they knew villains were around, or it'd be a tactical blunder. Since they were quickly told about the villains when the villains started to attack, them holding hands as they walked past Toga must have happened before the villains attacked. Despite Toga even demonstrated she knew their names, so probably knew their abilities due to the televised tournament they were in, the UA Sports Festival. Uraka and Essie. How does she know who we are? Maybe from the sports fest? We know nothing about her, so we're at a disadvantage. Despite that, Toga waited for probably around an hour before she attacked. And Toga was delayed till hero reinforcements would wander around after a long time. Therefore, society operations were not hiding Uraka and Froppy from threats, but instead holding Toga back. Looking at how they could have done it, since Toga is basically the greatest stealth person, you don't just casually find ways to manipulate her, which she also demonstrates extreme level of mental control, so is resistance to anything they could try to use on her to mind control her or alter her perception. And since society wouldn't have deployed extra resources to protect Urak and Froppy, as before stated, Ragdoll's plan included using the minimal amount of resources to encourage the villains to attack, so they wouldn't want to put in anything that would seem out of place. Therefore, there should have been nothing separating Toga from Uraka and Froppy. We clearly have missed something big, so we will have to dig even further. Looking at Toga's skills, she technically would be able to on her own avoid detection from her own forces and gather the information on her own when the hero reinforcements would arrive, making the coincidences the wandering hero group finds her by herself. Toga also during the match had happily yelled out, making the location obvious, and delaying a lot. Togo also, despite her incredible skills with a knife, had a trained, but still technically amateur, hand-to-hand -hand combat hero Uraraka restrained her. If Togo is a double agent, her convincing act, no one able to track her if she wanted to gather information to rig the match, the two class 1A secret agents not told anything, so the emotions would make Togo's act convincing, 
and at the end Uraraka despite having Toga restrain, let her go when reinforcements were right there, so should have held her there longer despite the creepy attack that had already gone on for a while, so no reason to lose her grip when reinforcements were seconds away from reaching them. Which a simple whispered code word, Uraraka knows, can have her let Toga go. So it does look like we caught another double agent. I do want to say, due to the possibility one of the double agents may be caught, they would limit what Toga and Dobby would be told. One or both of them may not even know the other one is a double agent. In case one is caught. Which probably happened due to how independent they seem to be from the one another. Also, even so, they would work around Deku's original quirk a lot, since Deku's original quirk has serious weaknesses, that can be exploited, society probably never told them to keep that information a secret and to make sure society can effectively use that godlike ace in the hole. Which instead society made sure Deku's original quirk knew to protect those secret agents and to assist them with their missions, which is still a helpful strategy. Basically, there probably were some good compromises they made when deploying these double agents. Due to this chronological analysis, I do need to address what both these double agents did prior to this, but at the same time mostly ignore the future information until I get to analyzing those episodes. So we won't get a full understanding of why they did what they did in this video. The two prior events are going to be the recruitment into the League of Villains and Toga murdering someone. First, the easier one, the recruitment. With society knowing the League of Villains is the only confirmed villain group linked to All for One, they would send in double agents as soon as possible to specifically join so they can look around to find the exact location of All for One to send that information to society so they can get him. The people running the double agent operation easily saw the propaganda of the popular hero killer Stain was with the League of Villains would be the way those villains wanted to recruit. People, so had both double agents spout that propaganda and had a significant amount of variety with one crazy and the other logical so plenty of variety in case Shigaraki has a preference. Since Shigaraki the leader of the League of Villains freaked out trying to kill them. Is your group really dedicated to the hero killer's mission? I can't imagine you are if you're gonna let this little psycho join you. Grow up. Jeez, why is everyone so hung up on Stain? He's all I ever hear about. You two are done! So his behavior clearly showed there was no way Shigaraki would be a leader of the group the hero killer Stain would be in. So then both Stain shows neither one of them is loyal to Stain's movement and they are actors trying to get into the League of Villains ranks. Now for the Toga smiling near a dead body scene. This one is another one of those events in the show that is very detailed, but hides itself effectively with the cryptic rules I've been analyzing throughout the series. You can detect something is there by how that crime scene blood location doesn't make sense under close inspection. First, that massive amount of blood on the wall being located right behind a slumped over dead body meant that was a massive wound inflicted on him. The blood in that person would be hemorrhaging out, eventually completely soaking that man's white plain shirt as a blood location corresponded to an injury height ripping through his shirt and also the back of him as there was no sign of significant injury in the front of him that blood could have come out of. Yet Toka was able to after having her fun with him and also with enough time to walk away a significant distance to celebrate giving ample time for the blood to turn his white shirt completely red. But it didn't, even remotely, soak onto the front of his shirt at all. Even if Toga used a blood training device, it wouldn't stop such a wound from bleeding out, enough to spread throughout that white shirt. Toga has in season 4 also while under the influence of a truth quirk and her own statements, stated only way to drain the blood was sucking it through her mouth. Which would not work and leave far more blood on her mouth. Therefore, this person was killed by something we are not aware of. Which is ample signs that this incident probably contains a hidden story. So for us to start digging it out. Since the heroes wouldn't have hired the blood draining mass murderer, Togo would have had taken that person's place. 
since she is claiming to be the blood draining mass murderer, so this was no random murder, but instead has to have had a much more sane reason why she killed him. My Future Deku narration theory rules that states this story is a retelling of events by Future Deku and often shows key details when they become relevant and this scene is part of a montage of the new recruits just before they joined the League of Villains, making all those montages scenes have a strong chance to symbolically and directly give relevant data on how each of them got recruited, making this murder probably a key part of how Toga joined, especially since we already dug out strong evidence something is hidden in plain sight. With that context, we can start making sense of the evidence in the crime scene, even so Toka had no normal means to kill him. That way, this killing did take place in the superpower world which blood controlling quirks are powerful enough to do that as demonstrated by Glad King able to control a massive amount of his own blood to restrain Dobby in a summer training camp attack. And that is a key statement because Toga claimed she is a blood draining mass murderer, which also says we should be finding the way Toga took the place of the blood draining killer in this scene, Toga being next to a dead body with ample signs of blood draining quirk was used in a fight between them basically strongly indicates that person Toga killed is the original blood draining mass murderer. Though there are still a lot of details we need to work out in this scene. Since Toga is working with an unethical hero aligned group that has great influence, they probably at some point took over the investigation as society tried to catch the blood draining killer then decided to once they closed in on the suspect, hide the information, then take him out secretly, so that Toga can take his place. Any normal approach had the potential to have him fight back, lead to far too many witnesses with the different agencies working together, and potentially having the killer use secret advantages he has causing a scene exposing who he was to the public, which would be something they want to avoid for Toga to take his place. But if they had presented him with a beautiful young girl, Togo walking to an alley would be able to have him not suspect anything as he expected a much more direct approach. So in a carefree state, headed to the isolated location to indulge in all his desires on Togo, which would explain the isolated, desolate, nobody else around environment he died in. Due to the fact the blood draining power was used to kill the killer as the only way his white shirt wouldn't be soaked at all is if his blood was drained away. With a quirk that probably was used in the murders due to how many superpowers were around. So the killer needed a major advantage such as sudden blood drain and instantly defeating any target so he can take his time with them. Having his way with them until they died. Since the blood draining killer probably didn't accidentally blood drain himself and also his powers probably would have stopped working well before he drained his body of his own blood enough to not let that gaping wound bleed out. Doga had to have drank his blood, turned into him, then used his quirk to copy the blood draining quirk. Which we can see by the small amount of blood on Doga's mouth showing Toga at least got one gulp of blood, which would be enough to have the rest done using the killer's own power against himself. Which in the future, Toga supposedly unlocks that power in a quirk awakening. So according to Toga, it wasn't available for this incident. But at this point, we shouldn't be trusting a single word that comes out of Toga's mouth. Which, since Toga was back into a corner about to die when she supposedly used that power for the first time, that is plenty of indications Toga was hiding that ace in a hole, but was forced to use it. Toga had plenty of reasons to do such a thing as hiding such a power from the ones she's infiltrating that thinks they know all her abilities would have Toga able to outplay them, with them not implementing proper defenses against a threat they did not know about. And to also make sure none of her potential future targets would defend against such a devastatingly effective infiltrating quirk able to turn into and use her powers a near perfect infiltration ability. This also shows another major ace in the hole Toga has, as she was able to say that lie when getting hit by a truth-telling quirk in season 4. This means that bragging about her powerful mental control to Deku later in third season is extreme. A perfect double agent, fully able to transform into targets, utilize her powers immune to any form of mind control, and perfect acting to make it convincing. So it wasn't possible for Toga to have avoided being snatched up by a powerful, 
group to utilize her power. With this, we now get back to the fight, which is clear Toga allowed the blood draining killer to get close enough to bite him so she can drink his blood, which Toga probably acted helpless, enticing the killer to get close, which due to the killer would quickly try to subdue Toga with a cut and a quick blood drain. The next thing that I'm going to describe happened extremely quickly, but Toga, to have instead, did the blood drain. We can see by the blood stain being close to standing height, the killer and Toga must have been standing the whole time. Also, since a person that loves to target beautiful women would be expected to feel her up as he kills her, probably trying to kiss her lips and see the fear in her eyes, so they were probably face to face with the killer holding Togo, which the moment the killer got his hands on Toga, she would look for a way to bite him to perform her finishing move on him immediately. Within a second, which again, for the highest chance of success, Togo would need to be, Face to face with him with giving her the most options by how human bodies move. Toga probably acted scared and helpless until the moment he was close enough, just before he'd be able to effectively restrain her and cut her with a quick followed up partial blood drain, which instead Toga immediately attacked. We can see there are no injuries on the front of the blood draining killer, so with Toga getting grabbed by the killer and face to face with him, Toga had to have stretched her out to reach his back and bites somewhere on his upper back, below the neck, as that not only explains the height of the blood on the wall, but also biting higher up on his body would have had the blood seep into the small shirt collar. That easily, with its small size, would have shown clear signs of any blood instead of being far too clean. Also, the killer would know that to protect his head with the amount of victims that be expected to have tried to attack vulnerable parts of his face. That bite would cause severe pain, having the killer try to get her off of him quickly and disrupt his abilities to cut and drain her. With the sudden pain and unexpected move from Togo, who was just up to that point cowering in fear. With Togo's strong bite, she was able to, in one quick gulp, drink enough of his blood, probably within a second of them being close range, to immediately start her transformation into him. Also, since she stretched to bite him, She'd be better off with her body not overextended, so would allow the killer trying to pull her off his back from the pain to bring her back to the front violently, with plenty of time to swallow the blood. Due to it is a battle, she'd want to breathe, so would open her mouth, and since Toka only needed one gulp, no follow-up swallowing needed, leaving a massive amount of blood left in Toka's open mouth, which a large amount of remaining blood would splatter out from her open mouth, with the violent movements bringing her back to being face to face with him, which would have the blood fall on the exact area we see splattering of blood on his shirt just below the face to face position that was stated before. At that point, since the blood draining power probably needs an open wound to gush out as a backbite wound locations where the blood was found to have been pumped out. The killer would try to cut or use cuts he already made on Toga to drain her into submission. Didn't have his way with her, but with Toga now able to transform, her body would turn into that humanoid blob form covering up all her wounds, leading to a horrifying for the killer experience with that glob monster now actively holding on to him, not letting go, with nowhere to cause Toga to bleed, making his blood draining quirk worthless. As her form stabilized into a mirror image of the blood draining killer, it'd be quite disoriented, so he wouldn't know if the cuts are uncovered to do a blood drain for at least a short amount of time, but Toga knew exactly where to strike, the bite wound on his back. So Toga easily activated the blood draining quirk first, and a large amount of blood gushed from his back, hitting the nearby wall, explaining the blood on the wall, which the sheer loss of blood quickly subdued the killer. The conclusion of Toga's attack that only had Toga vulnerable for a sh very short amount of time while the killer would get disoriented by her unexpected actions and pain he felt during it, making the safe bet Toga would believe the strategy would work. Toga would need to collect as much blood as possible to take his place in case the stated before society attempts to cover up the details of the killings may leave details Toga needs to demonstrate she can replicate, and also she wasn't leaving this guy alive with his confirmed blood drained death. With how his shirt wasn't soaked in blood and lack of blood around a dead body showing basically an almost complete drain and storage of his blood happened. 
which after the initial burst of blood hitting the wall to subdue the killer as quick as possible, Togo directed it away to store it when her victory was assured. That precaution ended up being unneeded due to she lied under the truth-telling quirk she didn't have that power much later on, showing confidence that the response wouldn't raise suspicion. Which means her psychotic act was all the proof they needed to believe her, though blood of a person able to use a blood quirk may make it valuable to be used for something else. Regardless of that, with the quirk loss of blood making the blood draining killer unable to fight back and fading into unconsciousness, he could see Toga fully transformed into him in a very similar holding him face to face to keep him from escaping, like the way he just did to Toga and his many previous victims. Which ironically, the blood draining killer in his last moments saw what all his victims saw, himself holding them face to face with draining the blood with the eyes of a hunter getting the prey and a mouthful of their own blood. Then he eventually lost consciousness, then died. Which he slumped onto the nearby wall once Toga finished with the prey she caught. Toga then stored the blood as we don't see it anywhere to use his powers later on to take credit for his crimes in case she needed to present that evidence to the ones she wants to convince she is a killer and also the large amount may give Toga more options and may also use abilities we haven't seen yet. Then in a celebratory way, walked away happy with the remnants of the initial bite blood on her mouth, which at that point the blood in her mouth was swallowed leaving a cleaner appearance, which is the only scene of that incident shown to us. This explanation fully explains all evidence from that murder scene and takes into account everything we've found out about her so far, but of course there are future events that eventually we will get to find out more about Toga, but for now, we'll move on. Now to get back to the summer training camp attack, there was one more factor which is a UA trader, but I have decided to not focus on a UA trader this time due to I determine that the UA trader knew in advance about Deku's original quirk and specifically made sure Deku's original quirk will misinterpret her actions, making Deku's original quirk actually consider her an ally throughout this and for a long time after. So to better understand what Deku's original quirk was trying to do, I determined it'd be best to only show what Deku's original quirk thought it saw. Which next video, I will show what actually happened. Now that we have broken through most of the lies, it is time to approach the rest of the video in a way my series normally runs, by just figuring out what Deku's original quirk did, and why did it do it? which without exposing those hidden factors, the actions of Deku's original quirk would make no sense at all. To start with, Deku arriving at the summer training camp. First, this secret hero operation required the fake summer training camp to be as convincing as possible. Therefore, until the villains approached, the summer training camp would be run as advertised as a boot camp, full of intense training. The group Class 1A that arrived under those circumstances had first faced a surprise start to the training through throwing the students literally off a cliff into a battle zone which they have to travel several miles while under constant attack by ground monsters that Pixie Pop summon. First, since Deku wasn't expecting it and Deku's original cook wasn't looking for it due to that fact, and once it was clear what was happening, Deku's original cook didn't have enough time to start up, so there was nothing it could do. Since Deku wanted to be trained, then his original quirk wouldn't interfere once active regardless. So the start of the training event went as planned. But once Deku was in the training event with enough time to scan the situation, we predictably see Deku engage the first monster, before anyone else could. As Deku's original quirk would easily see it approaching and would want Deku to excel, due to Deku desiring to excel in his training. There was a lie told to them about an unreasonable time limit, which Deku's original quirk probably detected the lie by either overhearing it, or through a simple scan determining it was impossible. Plus, Deku would desire to help his friends, therefore Deku's original quirk would pursue that objective, so would stay with them making sure Deku's original quirk would not focus on the time limit regardless. Close to the start of Class 1A training, we can see signs of the secret operation as Izaro explains in detail to Mandalay the sheer benefits and expectation he has of the training event, 
It is long and detailed enough that if I put in the audio, I probably will get hit with copyright infringement. But the main thing about it is Mandalay's expression of severe uneasiness. As that conversation had a strongly directly based the brutal betrayal she is going to inflict on a massive amount of children and virtuous people for the greater good in the upcoming attempt to save the world. Though Mandalay tries to indicate it is the expectations of the severe training that bothered her, that is not a solid excuse due to the sheer effectiveness of the teaching skills. Ragdoll able to scan any useful information for training, large amount of time, and the talent of the students, makes the betrayal she is planning to do to be far more on her mind during that conversation, explaining her unease. After that training event, the young child Coda caught the eye of Deku. Deku clearly was desiring to help the kid who seemed to hate heroes and was troubled, which we clearly seen Deku's original quirk malfunctioning pursuing Koda as Deku was forced to, without Koda noticing, for a very large distance, get followed to his isolated, probably miles away hideout, which is pretty creepy move if you actually think about it. And then over and over again gathers intels on Koda's situation, learning about Koda's parents' deaths as heroes fighting the villain Muscular, which only reason that would make sense is if it was Deku's original cook trying to get Deku aware of as many details as possible, including what Koda goes to figure out and plan to help him. As Deku's original quirk is limited to what Deku consciously knows, even if it knows details, he doesn't. Due to the social phobia Deku's original quirk has trying to, to not get itself spotted, so prefers to act on things it can make Deku aware of in advance, in most cases, such as this case. We can see an incident where Koda fell down from a high place due to the idiotic behavior of Mineta, which Deku caught Koda, but due to that incident was so quick, Deku's original quirk did not have time to activate. But Deku, by his nature of quickly acting when someone needs help and his high mobility, caught Koda, which since Deku's original quirk was not active, it wasn't a perfect catch, as Deku's original quirk wouldn't alter the impact Koda would experience by the sudden forceful move of suddenly changing directions of his falling movement, which the way Deku caught Koda knocked Koda out the rest of the way, which Koda recovered later on with no lasting injuries. We can hear future Deku narration very cryptically say his original quirk went off improperly to help Koda, specifically said he heard many viewpoints on the heroes and it'd be irresponsible to shrug it off, which is a true statement for most people, hearing why Koda feels that way, indicating respecting boundaries. I'd heard so many different people talking about heroes over the last few months. I'd listened to so many different viewpoints. It would be irresponsible to shrug them off. But then future Deku says, but I had no reply. And yet in that moment, I had no reply. Which, since Deku's original quote went off, pursuing Koda, voicing Deku to help Koda, Future Deku was stating he didn't make the decision, his quirk did. After that, with now that we know there are at least two double agents in the League of Villains, we can expect those double agents to be able to leak information about when the villains would approach, so the heroes would have the realistic chance to ease off the convincing training, allowing the in-training heroes enough time to rest to keep themselves alive, and to set up other factors if need be in advance. We can see around the time when the villains decided to approach this expected adjustment to the summer training camp can be seen. First, despite the massive surprise training event for Class 1A being the introduction to the summer training camp, when Class 1B arrived, they were in basically pristine conditions. Therefore, the heroes canceled the initial event for them so they'd be rested enough to survive the upcoming battle with the villains, which within that intense initial event Class 1A faced, had all the warning signs of being a mandatory initiation event. So this was a drastic change. Also, you can hear Class 1B implying the training hadn't even begun for them. But we have 20 unique powers in our class. What kind of training will help all of us get better? In other words, you'll have to break yourselves. <laughs> Oh man, this is pretty intense. Showing combined with the pristine condition, they had to have skipped 
the initiation event to the training, which even the teacher said, you haven't even started sweating yet. Therefore, it stated they didn't even train yet. Class A is already training. You all need to catch up. They also had no idea of the wild, wild pussycats by the response, showing they don't know them. Once we team up with Class A, there will be 40 students here. That's a whole lot of quirks for our homeroom teachers to manage on their own. Which is why we called them. That's correct! Four kittens and one litter! Which the wild, wild pussycats would have been the only ones running the initiation event. The wild, wild pussycats even gave either the name, power, or both, which is initial introduction information, just countless indications of Class 1B was at a rest zone waiting and it just arrived. Another factor, if they had sent Class 1B in immediately with Class 1A for the initiation event, that would leave the heroes completely defenseless in regard to fighting back as all the massive amount of in-training heroes would be too exhausted to fight for a period of time. But since they did bust Class 1B and Class 1A out at the same time, therefore basically had Class 1B waiting for a long time rested, they'd be able to quickly deploy them for them much closer to the summer training camp than if they were at UA, in case the villains decide to attack, due to advance warning of the double agents, while also can rest up Class 1A before sending Class 1B to never be in a state they'd be completely defenseless, as they run the deceptive baited trap disguised as a summer training camp. And it'd also be better to have Class 1A as soon as possible be in the desired battle zone as they are the effective bait so best be around the best defenses, instead of risking an attack in an insecure rest zone. Which Class 1B wouldn't have that problem, so they were forced to send Class 1A first as a mandatory precaution. The second major proof is even so all the in-training heroes seem to be intensely pushed to the limits, None of the in-training heroes that needed to fight were worn out for the long training. Except Deku, which we will be seeing some betrayal reasons for that one in my next video. Which would be made worse with Deku's original quote optimizing Deku's training to excel. Also, Ragdoll had worn out Tokiyami, control of a dark shadow to take out Moonfish at this point in time as well. We can see when Koda showed plenty of physical signs he couldn't take it being around the heroes anymore, which had him start to head out of sight into the forest, we see Deku walk out of a building able to barely spot him before being unable to be tracked, which was Deku's original quirk making Deku aware of the variables so that it can effectively try to help Koda, which this time was moving Deku around to catch sight of Koda before Koda was effectively hidden, unable to be pursued, as Deku's original quirk primarily only acts on information it has that Deku is aware of in most cases, to hide its presence. We can also see Deku's excuse on how he followed Koda has problems. By him following footsteps in the dark with such a large amount of trees blocking light with such a thick foliage and small tracks, so Deku pulling that off was an incredible feat. Even the wild wild pussycats say they didn't notice the tracks despite the massive and considerable time in the daylight they had been around there. As later on, Mandalay states she didn't know where Koda goes off to. Though Vagdal, who can scan it, had probably decided to give Koda space, so hid the information she knew. This makes it clear this was Deku's original quirk. There was a shooting star when Koda mentioned rejecting Hero's use of quirks. Everyone here is so crazy, calling people stupid names like hero and villain and then killing each other because of it, always focusing on their quirks. This could have been an actual remembered event. But with future narration rules, since this is a retelling of events by Future Deku, and Future Deku does state over and over again throughout the story that if he wasn't desiring to be a hero, such as the way Koda was, that the disasters of his original quirk stealing one for all, causing disaster in the future, would have not have happened, and he wished he did. Which Koda saying basically that, and then a shooting star with the symbolism of you wishing on a shooting star. This potentially is one of those times. Now for the Haunted Trail training event, the one that the villains will attack. Since Deku wasn't expecting an attack and Ragnarok's plans had put Deku's original quirk on standby mode, so not even scanning the training event for a long time, it didn't detect the villains sneaking up on the heroes and it 
didn't detect at all Pixie Bob rigging the order they sent Class 1A groups out. As Deku's original book, for the most part, ignored what was happening around it. Due to it was unknowingly forced into standby mode, which made it so when the attack warning signs of the fire started, Deku's original quirk needed time to start up, but since the fire also forced the villain to move, triggered a quick strike from the villains, giving Deku's original quirk no time to counter the ambush, leading to Pixie Bob being taken out. But Deku, by his nature, would try to rush in to help Pixie Bob, which he tried to do it, not knowing his original quirk was not able to help, putting Deku at a severe disadvantage compared to if he waited for less than a minute. But Mandalay and Tiger knew, so instead of focusing on as quick as possible, getting to the downed teammate, they instead both got in the way of the charging Deku. Due to since both knew of Deku's original quirk, ability to see and take advantage of any opening, during that hostage situation, they knew it'd be best to get resolved by an active information gathering quirk which they saw Ragnar had left, leaving only Deku as their only guaranteed option as they didn't know if Ragnar would address the hostage situation or leave it up to them and Deku. So Mandalay and Tiger forced a long pause to allow Deku's original quirk to activate. While doing that, Mandalay made sure Deku's original quirk knew as much information as possible by telling Deku what Tiger and Mandalay plus everyone else's orders will be. Everyone assisted in Deku's original quirk activating correctly with extreme amount of good intel. After a while, Deku finally showed clear signs of his quirk activating by stating he should head to Koda after the long pause instead of the helping them with the hostage situation. Mandalay and Tiger knew Deku's original quirk with his normal behavior of protecting the most in need meant whoever Deku was trying to get to first was probably about to die, which also meant Pixie Bob's injuries is not that severe due to Deku is not quickly resolving the in front of him injured unconscious hostage. Pixie Bob's situation. Before leaving, showing Pixie Bob would survive for a long time, which made Mandalay and Tiger immediately let Deku go to Koda to save that defenseless child while... Mandalay and Tiger just focused on the villains instead of the down teammate, as they assumed the two information gathering quirks on the field on the side would monitor Pixie Bob and intervene if she needed it. Once Deku's original quirk showed clear signs it was active, Mandalay and Tiger would know it would stubbornly follow the plan it made. So it didn't matter at this point if Deku's original quirk scanned enough of the data Ragnar was required to leave around, and the sheer amount of data they personally gave it. They just hoped it was good enough and sent Deku out. There, to by Ragnar's orders, assist her plans. Which if Ragnar didn't tell them that, then they wouldn't have allowed Deku's original quirk to actually alter the battlefield to attempt to not have it grew up Ragnar's plans. But Deku's original quirk probably quickly picked up on the fact as it scanned that Ragnar was active for a long time, therefore shouldn't have been caught off guard. That led to Pixie Bob's defeat, as Ragnar had no trouble scanning the other villains, but when it scanned for what caused it, or while scanning the entire battlefield to understand what was happening, Deku's original quirk couldn't detect anything that could explain it, so it soon whatever it was had quickly got outside of Deku's original quirk scanning range before being able to be scanned, using potentially means such as teleportation. But unknown to Deku's original quirk, this was the first move of the insider threat, the UA trader, that knew how to hide her tracks from the scanning, which I'll cover in my next video. As Deku's original quirk rushed to Koda, it could see Koda was facing the villain, Muscula, who was a psycho killer that murdered Koda's parents. By the information Deku's original quirk gathered, from the mentioned before earlier improper activation, having Deku trying to help the troubled Koda, 
which due to the activation had Deku learn of Koda's secret location, the place Koda is facing that villain, so had no issue prioritizing and heading directly to Koda. As Deku's original quirk didn't need to manipulate events to have Deku learn where to go, in its attempt to hide itself normal behavior. That is due to the social phobia it has. Deku's original quirk also knew from the information it gathered, Goda's parents took one of the muscular's eyes. So there was a high chance Koda would be attacked, but at the same time, Deku's original quirk knew it probably lose to muscular. So it'd be far better if it let Muscular go if he doesn't attack Koda to head to the easy to see Bakugo and Todoroki location to get killed by the fire and ice attacks and potentially with the help of Deku as well. Basically, it wanted to choose a far more advantageous battlefield to deal with Muscular, which had plenty of powerful allies instead of an easily killed and of crossfire child, making Deku hold back and accept taking direct hits to avoid that child from being directly attacked. But instead of Muscular leaving, Muscular decided for fun to kill Koda without realizing who Koda was, forcing Deku's original quirk to send Deku in with a last second save as it had kept Deku close by, hoping Muscular would leave to avoid that fight while at the same time make sure Deku would be there if things went bad. Which is one of the more common strategies of Deku's original quirk, holding Deku back then sending Deku in when it'd be the best time for him to arrive. Since Deku's original quirk knew Deku would realistically try to use his cell phone, that probably lead to other people that only get quickly killed to come over, and Ragnar was still up, which she'd be able to send him proper help Deku's way. Deku's original quirk decided to, with that last second save of Koda, have Muscular's attack break Deku's cell phone to not have Deku wonder why he didn't try to call for help. To avoid doing something obvious bringing attention to itself, as it normally tries to avoid being spotted at all. Deku's original quirk also didn't let Deku tell Mandalay and Tiger where he was going, to further keep others away from that death trap for their own good. Which Mandalay probably picked up on the fact Deku's original quirk had a reason to try and not tell her. So Mandalay didn't ask where Deku was going, which Mandalay should have if that wasn't the case, and that should have been one of the first responses to Deku saying he knows the location of Koda, unless Mandalay had a reason to not say anything. That landing broke my phone. I didn't tell anyone where I was going, which means I can't hope for reinforcements to show up. During the time with Deku and Muscular having a conversation before battle, Ragnar was taken down by a secret villain force off screen, leading to Deku being trapped with Muscular, unable to run and potentially may not have a chance if he fights with no help coming. If you look at the evidence of how Ragnar was taken out, a clear cover-up can be seen by a secret villain force. Ragnar's blood was found at the halfway table, a vast distance away from where she was last seen, at the opposite side of the trail, starting point, when the attack started, which she didn't assist any of the heroes along the way, which is very strange. And then the Nomu was found with a broken bloody equipment, but since that Nomu would be held back by Dobby and was far too stupid and powerful to not kill Ragdoll if it caused that amount of blood of hers to be spilt. That means that Nomu couldn't have took Ragdoll out, while also since none of the villains took credit, it had to have been a hidden villain group that is trying to not get spotted by this time giving the credit to the Nomu that isn't able to tell anyone it didn't do it due to the normal severe mental deficiencies of the Nomus. Later on, I will go into detail on why the group did that, but for now, we will move on as we need a few more details to figure them out. Now, back to Deku vs. Muscular, which, unfortunately, I determined it'd be far too complicated and long to explain this fight. So I will save it for the next video, as the UA Trader plans is all over this unfortunate predicament. Deku's in. I'll tell you now, this long stream of unfortunate moves leading to disaster was no accident. From start to finish of that event, the UA trader controlled what would happen for a plan that included the assassination of Koda and Deku by any means necessary. 
but since Deku's original quirk didn't notice the real reason why this happened, these questions will be ignored till the next video. After the match with the feet of Muscular, Deku's arms were now permanently damaged and his ability to defend himself or being able to fight back was significantly destroyed. And the only thing keeping him going would be the heavy amount of physical manipulation and a reduction of pain ability Deku's original quirk has keeping Deku's broken body moving the best it can. But since Deku's original quirk has no capability to care about the well-being of Deku in anything not related to an active plan, which a plan was to help the ones in need the best it can, Deku predictably headed back onto the battlefield with his broken body by his original quirk forcing him to. There were some logical statements Deku made about the plan to head back on the battlefield to deliver the message the villains were targeting Bakuko and potentially others in training heroes. Sounds like they're after some of us students. I have to let Mr. Aizawa and the Pussycats know that's one of the reasons they're here. We do see Deku smile while saying a bizarre excuse to Koda on why they aren't heading off the battlefield, which was to bring Koda to the massive forest fire to put it out. With how badly hurt Deku is and the high chance villains will notice the massive forest fire being taken out. Since Deku doesn't know he has a scanning quirk, he should have known it'd be far too dangerous. With how easily ambushed he'd be, with how visible putting out the forest fire would be, combined with his lack of ability to defend himself due to injuries. We're gonna need some help only you can give us. The forest has been set on fire. That means my friends could be trapped by the flames. Your water quirk can put those fires out. In the last episode, I did say that Deku's original quirk has a smiling side effect that requires heavy level of mental manipulation, which takes the form of the bizarre logic, physical manipulation in the form of Deku's original quirk doing a massive amount to keep Deku's broken body in the battlefield, and the bizarre decisions, which was for many reasons he shouldn't be trying to put out the fire. Since a smile appeared, this is clearly the smiling side effect of Deku's original quirk. Now after Deku took Koda deep into the battlefield in the direction of the fire, clearly, with how ridiculous taking out the fire plan was, Deku's original quirk was aiming for something else, in which Deku coincidentally ran into Aizawa, then was able to drop Koda off to him, then Deku headed into the battlefield, now not being held back from needing to defend a child. With Koda being safe, which clearly would be the goal of Deku's original quirk, move, as soon as Deku reached Aizawa, Deku was released from the mental manipulation, as not for a moment he mentioned his dumb firefighting plan in any form during the conversation, but still had some other forms of mental manipulation have Deku insist he should go back onto the battlefield to fulfill the protect everyone desire. With Azawa seeing Deku's injuries, and Deku run off to deliver a message to Mandalay instead of Aizawa who just as fast while also could have sent Deku and Koda to the rally point, clearly Aizawa had been told to not remove Deku from the battlefield. And they had to have really pushed the point with Aizawa due to the obvious severe injuries Deku had. Aizawa from what he saw of Deku figured adrenaline was the only thing keeping Deku going, which since Deku's original quirk knew this would happen as it sent Deku to Aizawa to drop off Koda, Aizawa must have been told some important things. It is unclear what he was told, but with Aizawa being such a professional, trustworthy, honorable hero, it is clear society's secret operations would find it very easy to work with Aizawa. But what secrets he was told is unclear. They may have told Aizawa that Deku would must be followed despite the reasons not given and that Aizawa has no authority over Deku during a crisis, so can explain why Aizawa sent Deku to deliver the message for all the in-training heroes. To fight, as Aizawa would know only Deku would be listened to. Though Aizawa's thoughts at many points were shown, a lot wasn't shown, specifically in regards to his involvement with his secret operation, which can be explained by my future Deku narration theory, stating that this story is a retelling of events by future Deku. So what is shown in the story is only what future Deku is sure of, showing it either directly or indirectly. Making Aizawa's partial thoughts being shown shows the trust future Deku has in Aizawa's report. And with the massive trust the secret operations have in Aizawa with also fulfilling the end of the bargain to take down the villain group attacking his students to a significant extent shows Aizawa in the future kept his promise 
to keep it a secret and told future Deku only what wouldn't break that promise. Which then led to future Deku, when retelling the story, put in what Aizawa was willing to tell him was his thoughts due to the trust Deku has in him, while also leaving enough information in due to we can dig it out to show future Deku suspects there was more to this event and what it probably was. Due to the plans to keep alive Mandalay and Tiger were broken beyond repair, leading to Mandalay dodging Spinner for about a half hour, which over that large time luckily and very skillfully managed to avoid getting hit by Spinner's sword that is made out of many swords, so if one hit killed her instantly, which then would have led to Tiger's death who was in a stalemate with Fixus Mag, unable to deal with a second opponent. Deku's original quirk would prioritize saving them next, which didn't need much manipulation due to the message Deku knew he needed to deliver and Aizawa being told to stand down when it comes to things related to Deku. We can see Deku arriving in ambush spinner when he left an opening destroying his massive sword, which at that point, with Mandalay's skills demonstrated by dodging and hitting spinner despite the disadvantages when spinner had the sword, basically guaranteed Mandalay would probably win. But instead of making sure Mandalay would, Mandalay told Deku he is far too injured and to head back to the valley point. Get back to camp right now! Those injuries aren't normal! I'm sorry, I can't! With Deku's original quirk, due to that would go against his plan, forced Deku to ignore it with mental manipulation, having Deku run away from her and not further assist them, because if Deku stayed and defeated both the villains, then Manley may forcefully remove him due to the sheer injuries Deku had at that point. Which would be an expected contingency plan in case one of the pro heroes risked the success of Ragdoll's plans to instead care for Deku's severe injuries. We can see that contingency plan with Aizawa as Deku's original quirk was taking advantage of Aizawa being told not to interfere with Deku by making Deku talk over him without pause trying to not let Aizawa say anything before Deku rushed off. So try to not let Aizawa have an opportunity to say anything, hoping the orders Aizawa got to not interfere would have Aizawa accept not being given an opportunity to speak. But Aizawa, through his concern for Deku, pushed through it and talked to Deku. We can see the fading fragments of Deku's original quirk plan to help in that area. With how Deku's original quirk adjusting to avoid staying there, would take time, which in the meantime, has been shown on many different occasions, Deku's original quirk would continue all its previous planned manipulation of Deku till the new plan had time to take its place. Which is a severe weakness of it, as deception can have Deku's original quirk trap Deku in undesirable positions for short but still long enough periods of time that could allow bad things to happen. This is the reason why we see Deku heading in the direction of Tiger and Big Sis Mag, fighting, and Pixie Bob, who was on the ground unconscious. Close by, but now able to be cared for, which with no villains can reach her. But that long distance Deku ran took enough time for Deku's original quirk to readjust the plan and instead mentally manipulate Deku to ignore all the things he could have done, and instead run into the forest leaving them behind to avoid being removed from the battlefield. Though that caused the villain to make critical mistakes with Big Six Mag trying to kill Deku, who got too close with stating enough to reveal he beat Muscolo, so was a major threat, with Spinner protecting Deku due to staying Team Deku worthy, leaving an opening for the heroes to win by sneakily attacking the distracted villains, who at that point didn't like each other, while seeing the other hero the other one was fighting sneak up on them, so for revenge, let it happen unknowingly, taking both out. But since it was all logical why everyone did what they did, and the signs it could happen were hidden in their minds, which can't be scanned by Deku, this was just a logical progression of events without direct intended manipulation. We can hear Mandalay thinking that Aizawa may not know what he is talking about, telling the in-training heroes to fight back which was a message Aizawa told Deku to deliver to Mandalay. Tell everyone in Class A and Class B that Eraserhead has granted the permission to engage in combat with the villain! I hope you know what you're doing, Eraser. But since Mandalay clearly saw that Deku sustained lifelong crippling injuries, 
from at least one villain while in this process of trying to carry a child to safety, as that is what Deckers said he was going to do. Mandalay! Coda! He's safe! Questioning Aizawa for saying they need to take out all the stops and fight back when they were before significantly holding back is a serious, negligent, unreasonable thought unless if we factor in the potential it could disrupt Ragnarok's plans, they can get unraveled by people not doing what Ragnarok wants. By Mandalay using her powers without Ragnarok's consent to tell everyone to do something completely different than what they were currently doing. Soon after Deku left, then Mandalay and Tiger were able to win, but with how Deku's original quirk was forcing Deku to flee, he didn't see it happen. With Mandalay and Tiger safe, Deku's original quirk then decided what to do next. With Toga and Dobby secretly being allies, they weren't needed to be dealt with, which also removed Nomu as well since Dobby was taking care of it. The villain Mr. Compress was staying back waiting for a harmless quick capture of the villain's target Bakugo strategy, so he was also not a threat to people's lives. For Mustard, Ragdoll's plans around Mustard wasn't disrupted by the other problems, and was going well enough. To realistically succeed, and due to the poison gas though, Deku shouldn't have been able to reach Mustard anyway, with how the gas masks were deep within the poison gas zone, out of Deku's reach, so Deku's original quirk couldn't help regardless. Leaving only Moonfish, the only active threat that may kill someone, so Deku's original quirk would pursue him. Which since Ragnar had specifically set up Dark Shadow to get Moonfish by making sure it goes out of control, when Moonfish attacks, and Moonfish had fled Dark Shadow successfully, Deku's original quirk saw it only needed to bring Dark Shadow over to Moonfish, while hoping Moonfish won't escape from it again. Deku's original quirk using the readily available intel from Choji's evaluation of Dark Shadow, attacking wherever it hears noise, had Deku consciously see they can use Choji's extending body parts, quirk to reach a far distance away, creating noise to lure Dark Shadow without Dark Shadow attacking Deku and Choji directly. For a long distance, which with also Choji using his senses to find out where Bakugo and Todoroki is, the only light producers that can contain Dark Shadow with light, they lured Dark Shadow over to the light source. Since Deku's original cloak didn't need to manipulate Deku to find that out, due to Choji giving that information, this led to a far quicker resolution to this problem, and also without Deku realizing it, take out Moonfish, the secret second target of Deku's original quirk, current plan. We can see Choji yelled out as they saw Bakugo and Todoroki to complete Deku's plan of using the light Bakugo and Todoroki can produce to immediately take out Dark Shadow, which was the wrong thing to do as they needed to take out Moonfish first. But there was nothing Deku's original quirk could do to convince Choji not to yell out due to the wave of death following them, but Deku's original quirk potentially kept Deku from saying anything with mental manipulation, as Deku didn't say anything in regard to that unknown to Deku bad idea. But Bakugo saw the opportunity to take down Moonfish with Dark Shadow and Bakugo led to an effort defeating both Moonfish and Dark Shadow. At this point, all threats were taken out and Bakugo, the main capture target, had a massive powerful force of heroes surrounding him. But it was a major problem. During all this, Toga was in a lot of trouble. Due to if she attacked two secret agents, she would have been forced to kill, badly hurt, or traumatize them to make it convincing. Due to neither of those had enough power to beat Toga, even if they worked together to the best of their abilities. Without a large force of heroes heading to those two double agents to assist them to give Toga an excuse to not finish them off, by giving her a reason to retreat, Toga was going to fail to join the League of Villains, for suspiciously not attacking so Deku's original cook would try to fix his situation. We can see when Deku, with his great reputation, decided his large group of allies head to the rally point, he stated they should avoid helping Mandalay and Taiga, despite Deku pointed out the voice they have is basically invincible. Honestly, with a group like this, we could probably even go up against All Might. And last time he was there, villains were attacking the heroes there with one of the pro heroes skulls cracked open, dying on the ground. So the heroes there obviously should have received assistance with Deku being the leader knowing this information. 
but Deku didn't even mention to the group the shield bat state the wild wild pussycats were in. Last time he checked, either. Deku just decided to head directly through the forest to the rally point, where no villain seemed to be. But I think we should get to camp. It's possible the pussycats are still fighting in the clearing. Going that way would draw the attention of the villains, plus it's longer. We should cut straight across. That is completely against Deku's nature. It makes no sense unless we factor in heavy amount of mental manipulation. So Deku was being forced to head to Doga, clearly to help Toga. There was a strong possibility Toku was tracking Deku and his team at this point, so Deku being in command could adjust her group to make sure she isn't detected, though with Toga's skill, that probably wasn't necessary. Which with the sheer path of destruction that plan inflicted on the forest, with massive ice spikes acting as a landmark, Toga would have no trouble finding them and would be looking for an expected counter-strike against the villains, so it would come over to investigate the massive commotion. As they approach Toga's location with Toga knowing they are coming, she made a lot of noise with yelling and happiness and having the yelling from the scared secret agents while also delaying a lot. Which made Deku's group hear it and adjust their heading directly to the commotion. With Deku not seeing anything that is happening directly as they approach, Deku's original quirk would be limited on what it can do as they approach due to the social phobia and be unreasonable for Deku with his broken body being carried by Choji to do anything meaningful. With Shogo was dragging out the situation till the moment they arrived, then delivered the code wood allowing Toga to disengage and to sprint into the forest that was a couple feet away, effectively and quickly hiding herself to avoid capture. Solidifying Toga's position in the League of Villains was such a convincing attack she orchestrated. During the situation with Toga, Mr. Compress had been able to swoop in capturing both Tokiyami and Bakko in small handheld orbs with his superpowers. Though it was distracting with Deku yelling to Toga and potentially Deku had adjusted the scanning the environment for danger to assist Toga, Toga had ran off long ago so Deku should have readjusted by talking to Choji immediately when Toga was clear. To cover the directions Mr. Compress could come from, Reminding Choji that despite what could happen, they can't let the guard down for a second, so keep scanning. And Deku probably could tell Choji to adjust her senses to detect many small signs Mr. Compress was around. Mr. Compress bound to have slipped up in some detectable way, but since Mr. Compress got through while Deku's original quirk seemed to not try to stop him at all, that means Deku's original quirk assisted Mr. Compress to capture Bakugo, therefore we have clearly missed something. Which, actually, we were tracking this hidden factor before. Because it was a hidden group of villains that did capture Ragdoll, and then planted false evidence on how she was captured, if we now start digging into what that hidden villain group has to be, then Deku's original quirk assisting the villains will make a lot of sense. First, Shigaraki, the incompetent and proven to be incompetent leader of the League of Villains, was backed into a corner. Despite he was chosen to be the inheritor of the godlike power, off one and a criminal organization, his massive amount of failures with every mission he publicly been the leader of has had his forces suffering great losses and always fell in a view of the public. If he was to demonstrate the same level of failure here, which this time the high-end criminal organization supplied him with many top-of-the-line villains, his reputation would be unrecoverable. Shigaraki needed a victory here, so all for one would of course send in a force to make sure Shigaraki wins, an overwhelming powerful force that will guarantee victory. But since having Shigaraki take the most amount of credit as possible is important, this group would attempt to hide the presence. Explaining why when they captured Ragdoll, they worked hard to give all the credit to the Nomu, which can't tell anyone what it saw due to its destroyed mental state. If Bakugo was able to be secured by the heroes, then this force would have been forced to move in but only if it can avoid the scenario that due to incompetent leadership, Shigaraki's force had to be rescued despite he used top of the line villains, and only sent in a large force after all his top of the line villains were devastated, and failed leading to massive backlash for throwing away such quality villains when he could have easily prevented their defeat, if he didn't incompetently hold back his force. So having Bakugo not captured when the publicly known villains were still around and not able to realistically get Bakugo, would be dangerous, which Deku's original quote knew, with Bakugo clearly in that state, drastic moves to get Bakugo to the villains was needed. 
which we see when Deku got the opening to rescue Bakugo from the villains, they had mostly been teleported away, therefore the hidden force couldn't give them credit. So completely worthless to attack them at that point, which if they did attack them, that would make it clear the sheer loss the villains suffered was easily avoided, and it was due to incompetent leadership, not using the powerful force it had effectively at all. Basically, once the inopened villain force left, the hidden villain force couldn't attack. We can see Deku's original quirk set up the point they'd be attacking the villains. First, Deku set up their strategy to use Uraraka to remove gravity from a group, then have Froppy would be able to throw them with her powers. And Choji adjusting the flight direction with his quirk growing a body part's power, and Uraraka gauges when she should deactivate her anti gravity. Deku delayed it till when they were finally thrown to be able to hit Mr. Compress, who was basically flying away when he was over the villain rally point, so the villains can try the strategy of fleeing with the captured in training hero Bakugo. Instead of the heroes having to deal with the hidden force running to wherever else they land, which would have been deadly. Also with the non-hidden villains all around, the hidden force would hold back to hide their presence as the villains had already suffered significant losses, so them now showing the faces after that would be devastating to Shigaraki's reputation. We can see Uraraka insisting on healing Deku putting splints on his arms, causing a delay, but it didn't interfere with Deku's original quirk plan, as they hit the target at the right time, which means Deku's original quirk correctly identified they wouldn't be able to pull the plan off in the most efficient manner. With many factors, such as Deku's injuries, them discussing Deku's injuries, and with how dangerous and complex the plan was, in general, a lot of hesitation can be expected, but in the end, launch at the perfect time. So Deku's original quirk planned to delay them if they went too quick and gave them enough time in case his companions delayed too much. When they landed, unfortunately Deku's original quirk got taken out of commission. Due to Toga being desperate to find an excuse to explain why she doesn't kill anyone, she chose to attack Choji in a realistic way according to a sexual driven fake persona that should be more interested in Deku. She attacked Deku giving Choji plenty of time with constant yelling out she is attacking and delaying with also posing with a knife allowing Choji to attack her then defend Deku. Due to Toga would be protected by Deku's original quirk, Deku's original quirk wouldn't have done the many things it could have done through using one for all through Deku's legs, but instead with Toga clearly attacking the injured Deku, it probably assumed Toga was trying something that required quick defeat of whoever she is attacking, which Deku being the most injured clearly stated that, so allowed Toga to do whatever she wanted to Deku, preventing Deku from manipulating anything else, so unable to guarantee success even if Deku's original quirk could see the opportunity to win. With Deku's original quirk out of commission, Dobby guarding the main capture target for excuse to not kill the heroes, so makes it very difficult to get to Bakugo. Basically, the heroes are having a lot of issues. Eventually, it got worse as Mr. Compress tricked the heroes into believing they have the captured in training hero by letting Choji grab decoy orbs, which with Choji fooled, telling the rest of the heroes to run, and all this happened without Deku's original quirk able to alter events to get past the deception it saw happen. With its scanning due to Toga trying to protect her secret identity, this would have Deku's original quirk let Deku get fooled. Due to its social phobia preventing Deku's original quirk from addressing the deception so it can hide itself. So they ran from their objective. But with that, the villains were being teleported out of there now making that a hidden force cannot approach anymore. So it was now time to rescue Bakugo. But as said before, this has turned into a mess for Deku's original quirk. So the chances of success were dwindling fast. We did get to see that Nomu eventually arrived and Dobby didn't activate its attack mode. But that probably isn't suspicious. Not even to the villains as there is no way to tell if Dobby has any more control over that Nomu Besides turning on and off that Nomu's attack mode, having there be a high chance it attack its allies due to the short time they were around that Nomu that probably required 
a lot of training due to its low intelligence to distinguish friend from foe. Plus, this gnomon will be captured by society in 24 hours, so we will probably never know for sure, but with Nomu's common problem of low intelligence, it probably couldn't tell who it should attack, probably would even attack its handler, Dobby, if Dobby wasn't careful. But fortunately, with Mr. Compress and Dobby being the only ones left, Mr. Compress decided to taunt the heroes, showing the deception, which the heroes that were far away realized they needed to charge back, but they were too far away. Fortunately, there was a hidden and training hero that followed the villains, and he used his laser beam to hit Mr. Compress, making him drop the orbs, giving the heroes enough time to run back. But due to the sheer injuries Deku has, and two powerful heroes, with Todoroki would freeze the villains who rescue at his leisure, and Choji with his incredible amount of growable body parts, plus Dabi, a secret agent, being one of the two villains, clearly, there was more than enough detectable advantages that be put at a disadvantage if they needed to protect a severely injured Deku, who can't even grab the orbs, as his arms were useless. So Deku's original quirk ended the pain, expression, and physical manipulation, having Deku crumple to the ground to keep him away. Choji managed to grab one of the orbs, containing Tokoyami, but Dabi could see that if he didn't grab an orb, he'd be called out as a double agent, so grabbed it. Todoroki was the one who attempted to grab that orb Dabi took, but Todoroki didn't strike Dabi. With a large amount of time, he could try to restrain him to grab the orb with the ice attacks. Due to Dabi calling Todoroki Little Shoto a very personal nickname, as Todoroki is named Shoto Todoroki, Poor Little Shoto Todoroki. We can tell Todoroki probably knew Dabi, explaining why Todoroki didn't attack Dabi. Later on, it will be shown this connection between Todoroki and Dabi is very big. But since Deku's original quirk can't scan minds and any factors that could indicate a past connection that was there, it had no idea of the factor and was completely surprised when Todoroki gave up, which Deku's original quirk knew, Dabi having now a clear path to make clean getaway with Bakugo, the captured target, Dabi was going to be forced to take it to avoid losing his double Asian status. As Deku's original quirk understood, those double agents will do anything to hide their secret double agent status, as they've been doing that the whole time. Though Dobby did delay to check if they captured the intended target, Bakugo, to attempt to give the heroes a shot at rescue, for that move was only delaying the inevitable capture of Bakugo unless something changed. With them failing, Deku's original cook realized it miscalculated, and in that long pause Dobby took to check if the orb he got was Bakko, readjusted the plan, reactivating physical manipulation and pain reduction to have Deku charge at them. But Deku couldn't make it there in time, and Bakko was captured. That seems to be all the information stored here, so I'll end my video here. In the next video, we will once again go over the summer training camp but instead focus on the UA Trader, which is Ragdoll. A very dangerous, secretly not aligned with the heroes or villains, but instead a revolutionary. Basically one of the earliest ones before the big revolutions in My Hero Academia. But also due to Deku's survive the prolonged assassination attempt by Ragdoll, while able to keep using his full strength throughout, this will allow us to truly understand the capabilities of Deku's original quirk, despite Ragdoll made sure Almost everything he could do would be ineffective. This understanding of Deku's original quirk will allow me, for the next video, rewrite other people's videos on Deku fighting random anime characters, as all of them basically place Deku's abilities far below what they actually are due to missing Deku's original quirk. This has been a Deer Runner. The Runner of Deer, thanks for watching.